city, to whom all praise is due, the Lord of all the world, who came in the person of Master Farad Muhammad, we forever give him thanks and praise for raising up for our deliberation, our de salvation and deliverance, pardon me, our salvation and our deliverance from hell, our leader, our teacher, the last messenger of Allah, the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. Sisters and brothers, we're very happy to be here with you and happy to have you here with us on an, what they call an inclement weekend. It's been a little more than inclement. We've getting, been getting washed away pretty good. But uh, we, don't, uh, we don't feel a thing. Because since we have heard the teaching of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, have accepted the teaching of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, we are now serving the same God that's doing the washing away. We, we don't have no fear of rain, hail, snow, or earthquake. Because <laughs> we serve the God of them all. And <clears throat> when you hear the teaching of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad for the first time, no matter when or where, it affects you. And those of you who are here for your first time, you'll be affected. And you may say, well, now, just because you say that, I'm going to make sure I don't be affected. I don't care what you say. <laughs> you'll be affected. And I can say that, and you may say, well, you know, who does he think he is? Nobody. Because I'm not talking about my teaching. <laughs> it didn't come from me. If I had taught you what was my teaching, then we'd all still be in the world of trouble. <laughs> but, <laughs> but the teaching that I bring to you is the teaching that the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, our leader and teacher, got from God. So I, I'll brag on it forever. Because I know what it's done for me, and I know what it's done for others, and I know what it'll do for you. And I'll stand on the rooftops and tell the world that there's no teaching like it, that there's no God but Allah, and that the Honorable Elijah Muhammad is the last and greatest apostle of Allah. I'm just here. <clears throat> I'm a minister of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. Like all of the many other ministers that he has right here in Los Angeles. You see the rest of his ministers daily. They walk up to you, the Muhammad Speaks newspaper in their hand. That's a minister of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. And you'll find, you can go right down in the court record, and you'll find that according to law, even the law here recognizes them as ministers of their religion. You find that uh, this is some of the uh, reasons that there have been those who have been propagating their particular faith have been given exemption from armed services and things on the basis of doing nothing but what these brothers are doing out in the street. There are men who never mounted a rostrum, never stood behind a pulpit, and never preached to anybody that have been deferred in the service, from the service, for the simple reason that they were propagating their faith as much as anybody who was standing up there doing all of the talking. So there's no way you can tell me that I am a minister, one who is propagating the teaching of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, getting it into the ears of the people, that makes me a minister, and that here's a brother, like some we got here, who reach more people in a week than I do in a month, and he's not a minister. And he's not propagating something different. He's propagating the same thing I am. When he says Muhammad speaks newspaper, that's Muhammad speaks. He's got the Honorable Elijah Muhammad's teaching, putting it into your hand, into your eyes, so you can get it into your brain and into your heart. What then could I do that he's not doing? I talk to two or three or four or five hundred on a day, and he'll reach that many thousand almost in a week. <laughs> And then they pass it on and on and on. So we want to just make it clear what our position is. First, to let you understand that we know what it is. Second, to make sure you understand what it is so that you won't get off on the wrong track and, uh, you know, get mixed up. Just like if you were sick and you called the doctor and the doctor examined you and saw what was wrong with you, and then the doctor called in a prescription to the drugstore. And then the druggist mixed up the prescription, and then the druggist sent it by the delivery boy over to your house. And you got your medicine, and you took the medicine, and you got all right. Well, naturally, then, your thoughts would turn to what a good doctor you have. You'd recommend him to your friend, wouldn't you? You'd say, oh, Dr. Thorne's so wonderful. I was sick, and he got me some medicine, and it got me just like that. 
just took care of me. Then, of course, you would say, if they say, well, where's a good place to have a prescription? Go, oh, the drugstore down the street is wonderful. Yes, so they mix it just like he said it and send it on over, prompt, a good delivery service and everything. But you never did talk about the delivery boy. Why? He didn't do nothing. All he did was just bring a package. He didn't have nothing. He don't know no medicine. He don't know no pharmacy. All he know how to do is pick up the package, bring it to the address. All he has to do is be able to read. And if he can't read, all he needs is a good memory. The man can tell him the address. He don't even have to know how to read. Man, just tell him. Say, now you take it to such and such a place. And if he knows the city and got a good memory, then he can take it. Take it to the one that it's addressed to. Take it to this address and deliver it to this person. That's all he got to be. All, he, all, if he's smart enough to do that, he's smart enough to be the delivery boy. Because he doesn't have anything to do with diagnosing the symptoms. He doesn't have anything to do with deciding the best medication. He doesn't have anything to do with mixing the chemicals together. All he got to do is just pick up the package and bring it. That's the way that I am. You and I are sick people. Now, sickness is so grave that it took God himself to even diagnose it. It took God himself to know what we need to cure our ills. It took God himself to prescribe for us the medicine suited to our needs. Now, God has given this prescription to one that he has chosen from among us, raised him up, and has given him the prescription. And it is the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, divine drug, <laughs> coming from the supreme doctor, who has given us the medicine that cures our ill. He's one man, can only be in one place at one time. And there are 22 million sick black people all over America. So what he has to do then is, according to the directions God has given him, mix the medicine and send his delivery boys throughout the country to try to get these patients who are now on the critical list and get to them in time. They say, well, what is, what's this great illness that we got? You name it, we got it. So you start just thinking about all of the different things that, the, the different types of illnesses that there are. As the Honorable Elijah Muhammad teaches us, for every physical law, there's a spiritual counterpart. Do you know for every physical ill possible, besides you and me having so many physical ills from following white folks, you know that just about every physical ill there is, we have a spiritual ill just like it. You know that? I mean, you can take the word, take muscular dystrophy, which is one that, you know, won't let you control your muscles. They may go any way they want at any time they want, you know, all out of joint. Now, if that doesn't describe the so-called Negro's mind, I give it up. It might do anything at any time. There's no control at all. Leprosy, that's something that what, turns you white. When you get turned completely white, it kills you. And you know we got that bad. <laughs> okay, you do all that. <laughs> you just name them. <laughs> you name them and we got them. One of the prime things that makes us unable to fight all the rest of the ills is one that's commonly known as amnesia. This is the thing that's got us most of all. Because not only do we have all the other things, but we don't even remember how we got them. <laughs> when a man loses his memory, that's amnesia. When a whole nation of people lose their history, that's mass amnesia. <laughs> This is the 22 million so-called Negroes in America. We are suffering from mass amnesia. Total amnesia. You know, there's different degrees of amnesia. Some people can remember some things and can't remember. The so-called Negro is suffering from total amnesia. If you ever see a patient that gets a blow or a shock and they suffer from total amnesia, they don't just walk around and say, who am I, like they do in the movies. That's not the way total amnesia works. 
Total amnesia, you forget everything. You forget how to walk. They have to teach you all over again how to walk. You forget how to talk. You forget everything. You are just like you were the day you came into the world. You don't know nothing, and you don't know nobody, not even yourself. So everything, then, you have to be taught. This is the shape that you and I are in. You forget your walk, forget how to talk, forget your name, forget all your friends. You forget your enemies. But anybody can walk in the room. You don't know whether they're friend or foe. You don't know nobody. You have to wait for somebody to tell you something. Somebody walk in may have been the worst enemy you had. They may walk in, and somebody may tell you, say, oh, this is your partner. Well, then you go for it. Why? Because your memory's gone. If you had your memory, you remember what he did to you. Ain't no way in the world nobody going to tell you that's your partner. But your memory's gone. And you got somebody there that you trust. And you're taking their word for everything. You put your trust in somebody who's standing there identifying everybody else to you. Say, now this is your enemy. You say, oh, that's my enemy. Man walk up, you growl. Ah! Might be the orderly come in clear of you and we look a little strong with this food. I ain't done nothing to him. You know? But that person that you trust told you that was your enemy. And if somebody asks you, well, if that's your enemy, what did he do to you? You can't tell him. All you know is that the one you trust said, that's your enemy. I want you to go to Germany and get him. I want you to go to Japan and get him. I want you to go to Korea and get him. I want you to go to Vietnam and get him. That's your enemy, boy. <laughs> oh, please, do that a lot. If you had your memory, you might have to look at the one who's telling you that's your enemy. Because if you had your memory, you might discover that the one that's telling you who your friends are and who your enemies are has been the worst enemy at all. In fact, he's the one who put you in the shape you're in in the first place. Now, some of you, you got your memory back and found that out. you look at him a lot different, wouldn't you? You say, you've been choosing my friends for me. Tell me, don't mess with him, you get in trouble. Don't listen to that Muhammad, you get in trouble. I'm your friend. Look at him and say, now look, I've been in trouble all this time. And you had me under your care. But you said, don't listen to Muhammad or I'll get in trouble. You have to look at him awful funny. This is why the white man doesn't want the honorable Elijah Muhammad teaching you and me about ourselves. Why? Because if here's a man that has hit you in the head and given you amnesia, you wake up, you don't know he's your enemy. He's got a chance to take all sorts of advantage of you. He don't want nobody coming along trying to probe into you and make you remember. Let's put him on the spot. He got a good thing going, as long as you don't remember. So when you start reflecting and say, you know, I do kind of, I was wondering what this lump was on my back. I was wondering why I get them headaches all the time. Yeah, I do remember somebody swinging up. Yeah, I, there is a dog bite right here in the tail of my leg. I wonder who sick that dog on me. I mean, I don't want you remembering all that. <laughs> no, he's going to take you. And we're still talking about this amnesia victim. You can think of, just think of a person with amnesia and just, Imagine the case and then think about the 22 million so-called Negroes and see if it doesn't fit. Just imagine. Here's a man that has put you in bad shape, hit you in the head and given you amnesia after he did everything else to you. Then he hit you in the head so you wouldn't remember all the other stuff he did to you. All right. Now he's fortunate. He look up and you can't remember nothing. He said, oh, yeah. Oh, well, I'm your friend. I've been your friend. He said, well, where did I meet you? Oh, we were, we've been friends a long time. Oh, I've always been good to you. Why, do you know he didn't come over in your house and kidnapped you, a couple of your babies, and ran out of the house while people shooting at him? And then he's going to tell you, and you were ruling the house. You had rubies and emeralds and diamonds. You were eating better than him. You were sleeping in soft beds while he was still running around sleeping on stone slabs. You had plumbing and toilets while he didn't have nothing. You know, big old castles with nothing in them. Just run over in the corner and do whatever you're going to do right next to the dinner table and all that kind of stuff. That's the way he was living. But you, yeah, but you've got, you're living good in your house. you got all the modern conveniences. He ain't even got an outhouse. Okay, you cooking on a stove, he ain't cooking at all. He has to eat raw. This is the way you're living. But now you got amnesia. You don't remember all that. So he'll tell you, oh, you, you should have seen your house. It was just all messed up. Everything all, you lucky I came over and got you and brought you over here. <laughs> it 
kept you cleaning up my house and cooking for me and washing my dishes because you was in bad shape in your house. I mean, you was an ignorant savage in your house. You ain't got no memory. You got I mean, You got to go for it. You say, well, boss, I sure thank you. You sure are a good friend, ain't you? Nobody else would have thought enough of me to come over there and get me. What? Huh, boss? <laughs> So now he's got you as if your life began now. So he asked the black man about black man's history. They start back on the plantation. They start on the plantation. Man, well, how'd you get on the plantation? Don't tell us that's where all, you mean to me black people originated on the plantation? Where we come out of a cotton bowl? <laughs> As far back as we go. Why? Because he wants us to believe that this is where everything started. That's as far back as we go. That way, all we got to look to is him. So he's got us so that to improve means to walk more like him. To improve, to progress means to talk more like him. To make progress and to seek equality means to act more like him. Dress more like him. Eat more like him. <laughs> Amnesia victim. Go to his church. That's what a man would teach you if, you if you don't care what church you went to. You get amnesia, he can tell you, oh, this is your church. Take you to his church. Can't nobody tell you that ain't your church. It's the only church you've ever known that you remember. <laughs> but it was there when he got you, remember? Same way with you and I know we, we, we should never run around talking about these churches being our churches. The white man had Christianity when we met him. <laughs> when we met, we didn't have it, he had it. The first slave ship that came to pick us up was manned by Christians. The slave traders were Christians, the slave buyers were Christians, and all of those plantation owners that put a cat of nine tails on your grandmama's back were Christians. Every one of them. <laughs> you know we got a bad case of amnesia. We forgot all that. You know that? We forgot all that. As the Honorable Elijah Muhammad said, our foreparents would raise up in our graves, in their graves if they could, and shoot us down like dogs if they could see the way some of us are acting now. After some of them were beaten to death, they used to take lead pipes and beat them to death in the cotton rolls, just break their backs and leave them laying there in the cotton rolls because they'd catch them praying, turning to the east saying, Allah Wakbar. <laughs> praying in the language that we used to have, to the God we used to serve, Allah. <laughs> They used to kill the slaves for that because they didn't want you to grow up knowing nothing about Allah. They wanted to teach you about a nice white Jesus. And they used to kill the slaves for that. Used to lash them. And then they would just pour salt into their wounds and let it burn. So it could heal up by, stop bleeding by the morning so they could go out and pick more cotton. When they finally would decide to destroy them, they had all kinds of things like hitching each of four limbs to four horses and beat the horses and let them run in four different directions and tear them apart. Or tie the ankles, tie down two young sapling trees, tie their ankles to it, and then cut the ropes, and then let the tree rip them down the middle. No right. same people today. Right. Their children, their grandchildren, their great grandchildren. Right. <laughs> and the great grandchildren of the slave that they did like that. Right. Walking arm in arm, hand in hand, right. cheek to cheek, right. talking about we shall overcome. <laughs> They've been overcome. <laughs> Praise to God. <laughs> Criticize our leader because he advocates that we stay away from the children of our slave masters. So yeah, he advocates that we go away from them and stay away from them. And for that, he's criticized by black people, the great grandchildren of the people who suffered the worst treatment that any people have ever suffered and suffered it at the hands of the same white man that they want to defend. <laughs> what kind of fools are we? We're nuts. We got amnesia. We must know our own history. We must buy history before we started imitating white folks. The only man that has brought us our own history is the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. White man has hid all history of black people, except his own, you know. 
He's got his European history, in which he has a few black people playing a little part in there, helping him build white civilization. Then he has what he calls Negro history. Negro ought to be ashamed of themselves, going for that. Ah, oh, we're finally making progress. Well, they got Negro history in the public schools now. Another shade of brainwash. They're going to teach you the great contributions that Negroes made to this country. And, then, and they're still not going to teach you all of them because you're still getting mad and figure you might, they might owe you something. Yeah, they'll teach you about the ones they figure you're going to find out about anyway. George Washington Cobb, Booker T. Washington. Oh, they're going to teach you about a bunch of them. And now they even teach you a little bit about Benjamin Banneker since that's gotten so widespread, since the Honorable Elijah Muhammad has blown a whistle on him so hard, telling about the black man that laid out the city of Washington for him. They didn't have enough sense to lay out the Capitol. And, uh, he, you know, made the first almanac they had, the first clock. That's what Big Ben is for, Big Ben Banneker, not Big Ben in London. Big Ben Banneker, black man, you know. <laughs> you know. All that. And, uh, you know, you got cats like Grant Green, who, without him, you wouldn't have no telephone system. I don't care what they say about Alexander Graham Bell, you still would have been walking around with a tin can with a string on it if it hadn't been for a black man named Grant Green. <laughs> You'd be, they'd still be having a million train wrecks a year if that same Grant Green hadn't invented the automatic switch to make the track switch when trains get a certain distance and all this sort of stuff. You see, black men, they were geniuses. Uh, but they, don't, they, they, they teach you a little bit about a few of them now, but they don't, even, they don't teach you about the black man that's got the patent on the refrigerator. Got the patent on the ironing board and the iron. Got the patent on the electric range and the gas range. The washing machine. They don't tell you about all that, do they? No, they're not going to tell you all that. Because after a while, you quit believing you can't get along without white folks, and you wonder how white folks ever got along without black folks. I mean, you can get everything in an aerosol can now, can't you? Everything comes in a spray can. A black janitor, <laughs> a black janitor working in a plant made the thing. <laughs> and they got everything in it. Anything you name just about, you can get a spray can of it. Black janitor, he didn't have no, all them chemists and physicists in there with all them degrees, sweating and carrying on. He come in at night cleaning up the place and messing with that stuff and came up with the aerosol can. <laughs> See, white men want to accuse us of teaching black supremacy. I mean, you just check black for yourself. <laughs> Nobody else in our shape can do the things we do. That's why the Honorable Elijah Muhammad keeps trying to tell us. We've got to be God's people. No other people would have been so endowed by God to not only survive, but to thrive through all this adversity. Nobody else could make it. They tried everybody else if they could. You read American history. They tried, naturally, they weren't going to go all the way back over in Africa to get somebody to work for them. And they had all these millions of Indians here. They tried the Indians first. They couldn't make it. They had Chinese that they brought over here. They couldn't make it. They even had some white folks that they took out of prison and brought over here, indentured servants and things. Irish, that's one reason the Irish and the, you know, and the English don't get along too well. They brought some the Irish over here. They couldn't make it. Couldn't nobody make it but us. They even went into North Africa by their own stuff, tried to get some of them Arabs up there. Brought some of them up, they couldn't make it. And they got to searching around saying, we need the best stock. We need the toughest man on earth. They got to bribing them Arab chiefs and things and all that stuff. And after a while they pointed, they said, there it is. That's the tribe down there. You get them, you got the best. If they can't do it, it can't be done. When he got us, he got the best. Hits us to the back and the front of the plow. Now, you know that's something. I mean, plows kill from mules. But they hitched us to the back and the front. And we made it, didn't we? Praise the Lord. So brothers and sisters, we only are trying to show the condition of the so-called Negro. And to show the bad shape that we why we need a messenger from God. We need one for the same reason that the Israelites, according to the Bible, 4,000 years ago in Egypt needed one. Pharaoh had hidden their history. The book said that Pharaoh had hidden their history. They didn't even remember the God of their fathers. Didn't even remember the name of the God they used to serve before they went into slavery. They didn't know anything about themselves or their God. And the only way they got free, Pharaoh was able to keep them in bondage until they got teachers that didn't come from Pharaoh. The minute they got a teaching that didn't come from Pharaoh, the spirit of freedom started waking up in. Took it 40 years for it to get awake. But it started the first time Moses opened his mouth. 
and said, I have met with the God of our fathers. If the seed started sprouting, the seed of freedom, and nobody could put it out. Pharaoh threw Moses in jail. He put more work on the people. He persecuted the people who tried to follow Moses. He did everything he could, but instead of the seed diminishing, it kept growing, 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 until finally Moses got his people completely free. Where did the teaching come from? That wasn't from Pharaoh. Didn't come from the professors that had been trained in Pharaoh's school. All they knew was what Pharaoh taught them. Didn't come from the politicians who had their political training under Pharaoh. All they knew was what Pharaoh taught them. It didn't come from the magicians, which is the name given to the religious leaders that were trained by Pharaoh, because the only thing they knew was the tricks taught them by Pharaoh. They studied in Pharaoh's seminary. Now, how are you going to get a people free from a man and he's teaching you? He's not going to teach you freedom for his slaves. He's going to teach you that which will bind his slaves closer to him. It was none of them. It was another man raised up by God himself, not trained in the universities of Egypt, not trained in the theological seminaries of Egypt, not sitting in the Senate and lobbying before the Congress of Egypt, but a plain old man, slave, hidden, had to keep his identity hidden. Said he was raised up right in Pharaoh's house. Pharaoh didn't even know it. God reached down and got him. And God taught him himself. He didn't entrust it to him. He didn't send no angel. He didn't send no vision. He didn't send nothing. God taught him. How to be face to face as a man talks to his friend. You don't talk to no friend from behind no burning bush, do you? No, that's a symbol. The Honorable Elijah Muhammad teaches us that that's a symbol of something else. But there was never a time when Moses went out and he was a bush on fire and he's talking, why, if you go, if that was God, then every time you strike a match, you have to pray. No. This was a symbol of something else. But it said that when, when Moses actually talked to God, that he talked to him face to face as a man talks to his friend. And, you know, some of the, you know, religious leaders try to say, well, well that really he was talking to him face to face, but there was a veil thrown up. You don't talk to your friend through no veil. You be talking to your friend and you say, hey, man, open the door. He said, no, I'm talking to you face to face, but I want to keep the door. But you even wonder what's wrong with him. He said, wait a minute, man. I mean, aren't we really friends? What you trying to hide? What is it you don't want me to see? No, when a friend talks to a friend face to face, they're looking at each other. <laughs> he said, well, that's not possible. No man has ever seen God. <laughs> well, we're following a man who has seen God. <laughs> Praise be to God. We're following a man, walk with God, talk with God, eat with God. He said, oh, I just can't see that. You mean you didn't learn that in the church? What were you studying? Where were you when the, when the Bible said Enoch walked with God? Where were you when the Bible said that Abraham had dinner with God and even gave the menu in the book of Genesis? Where were you when it said that Abraham told God he looked tired, let him wash his feet, let him wash his face, and God said, go ahead. He wasn't, no, he wasn't going to say, well, I'm a spirit. I don't need no. He said, do, do as thou hast said. He said, man, you're talking too much. Go on and, you know, take care of the business. <laughs> I mean, really, if you, if, you read, if you read that in the Bible, you can see what God was telling him. Because he was a man the other night. He told him, you look tired. You look weary. You're dusty. You look hungry. And Lord, I tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to go get, I'm going to tell my handmaiden to bring some water. And I'm going to take this cloth and I'm going to wipe your face and I'm going to wipe your feet. Then I'm going to have my wife to go and kill a young, uh, lamb, a young calf and make you some veal and make you some cakes and get you some milk. And honey. Well, you know, here's a man sitting here. You told him he looks tired. He looks weird. He looks like you're sitting up here going to describe all this good treatment and good food. He said, look, man, oh, fine. You're spending too much time talking about it. Do as thou hast said. Don't just say it. Don't say it, you know. And look, this is the way that it happened in the Bible. Now, if God didn't have a stomach, why was he hungry? It was the dust on if he didn't have feet and face. And how could he get tired if he didn't have <laughs> you know, just take it for yourself. And, it said, and you know Abraham didn't make a mistake. He's the only man in there that ever said was a, Abraham was a friend of God. That's what the book says. It says it in the Bible. It says it in the Holy Quran. Holy Quran says Allah took Abraham for a friend. The Bible says Abraham was a friend of God. Both books bear witness that Abraham was a friend. You know you know your friend. If you're a friend of Joe, you're not going to look up and see Sam and say, hey, Joe. 
No, you're going to call Joe, Joe, and Sam, Sam. So when Abraham looked up and saw three men walking toward his tent and went down and knelt in front of one and said, Lord, he knew who he was talking to. Book said it was three men walking. Abraham, a friend of God, went up and called one of them Lord. <laughs> All right, let's understand what we should be worshiping and what we've been taught to worship by our enemies. <laughs> We're following a man who walked with God, talked with God, ate with God as Abraham did. Met face to face with the God of our fathers. That was the difference. That's what made Moses successful. Moses, unlike the elders of Zion, who had been trained by Pharaoh to keep the Israelites in bondage, he had not taught them of Pharaoh's God. Was, the elders of Zion were teaching the people of Pharaoh's God. See if I, how plain I can make it. They had their places of worship. You go into the slaves, go into the Israelites' place of worship, and you go into Pharaoh, the Egyptians' place of worship, you find them calling on the same God, reading from the same book, and singing the same songs, and that kind of stuff. Got the same pictures, the same statues, and all that. No slave can get free from his master, worshiping his master's God. And the slave didn't give the religion to the master. The master gave it to the slave. So you know who's going to benefit by it. <laughs> all right, so that's why Moses had to go back. Before they were slaves, they were free. Now, under slavery, they had one God and had no hope for freedom. But in freedom, they had another God. So the God that Moses met with was the God that they used to worship when they were free. Back in their home country, that was the God that they worshiped. Moses had to meet with the God of freedom to get them out of slavery. As the Honorable Elijah Muhammad had to meet with the God of freedom to get us out of slavery. The God that our foreparents worshiped, the God that is still worshiped over in our homeland, all throughout Asia and Africa and the Middle East, Allah is God. Islam is the predominant religion. The religion that you and I had before we were brought into the chains and made Christian by Christian. Because that's the way the white man had in mockery of God. Would always show in the movies that the only people who worshiped Allah were beggars. And they would always be standing on the streets when white folks come by and they'd be saying, Arms for the love of Allah. It's the only thing, only time we ever heard the name of Allah in the movies with the beggars. That's mockery of God, for which the white man will pay dearly. Right. Oh, yes. God will not be mocked and not make you pay for it. All praises due to Allah. We are slaves today. Many of us think we're not. The Honorable Elijah Muhammad teaches us that a slave is one whose power and authority is ruled by another. It doesn't say it's one who doesn't have any power and authority. Slaves had a lot of power. You read the Bible, you see some of the slaves were placed in high positions in the land. Joseph was one who was placed over the grain house, over all of the food of Egypt. They had a lot of slaves that rose up. Daniel and all his followers were placed in authority in the land of Babylon, yet they were slaves. Doesn't make any difference how much power and authority a slave gets as long as it's ruled by somebody else. He's a slave. This is what makes us slaves. Find all of these black politicians, like one that just got elected U.S. Senator, the highest political plum a black man has plucked since Reconstruction. He's a slave. All that power and authority he got is ruled by white folks. He can get out, but he's the only black face in the Senate. <laughs> they got 199 white folks in him. Now what can he run? <laughs> Think about that. We're slaves. The Honorable Elijah Muhammad teaches us further that a slave is one whose sphere is limited according to the wishes of his master. Don't care how wide the sphere is, as long as there's somebody that controls it, still a slave. If the white man lets you in every school in America, lets you eat in every restaurant, lets you live in every neighborhood, and lets you work in every place of employment, you're still a slave because he lets you do it. See, how wide the sphere is, it's controlled by your master, you're still a slave. <laughs> so then, we today need a liberator as the Israelites needed a liberator. We need someone to take us out of slavery, not someone to hook us closer to the slave master. <laughs> and the same question arises among the hard-hearted, rebellious, white-loving, jealous, so-called Negro leaders. Well, now, as I heard one say just a few days ago in a meeting, a few weeks ago, rather, in a meeting, that, well, we ought to all unite, but you can't think at any time that the Negro is going to submit to just one leader. 
they were knocking at the honorable Elijah Muhammad because uh, that's they know he's the only one qualified to be the only leader. But, you know, we can't submit to that because look how hard we've worked to get our groups together. And I mean, we've got a history behind us and we've worked hard. We can't just submit our leadership to somebody else. Why not? They can't lead nobody else. So what are they going to do? No, they want to holler about, well, who says Muhammad has to be the only leader? That's the same thing they asked Moses. That's what they said in the Bible. Who made you the leader? He said, God made me the leader. That ain't good enough. They want to know what member of Pharaoh's staff <laughs> made you the leader. Now, if the white man says this is your leader, that's your leader. That's right. That's the way they respond. That's the way they, they're responding right now. They're responding right now. The white man says, and this is a good brother, but he's being you. The white man is telling the black nationalists now that Stokely Carmichael will is their new leader. And they're going for it. They're going for it. If it was not for the white man promoting him like this, they wouldn't go for it. They wouldn't believe it. they say, who was he? Who does he think he is? But the white man is saying, yeah, this is your leader. So they're all jumping, yeah, yeah, this is the man. <laughs> Stokely ain't never, they asked Stokely who was he leading. He said 155 members of SNCC. That's who I'm leading. That's our total membership, and that's who I'm leading. Yeah, you know, he's intelligent enough to know better than that, you know. Who made you our leader? Oh, you're trying to, what else did they tell Moses? You're trying to make yourself a prince over us. What they're saying? You don't have any right to exalt yourself. And there's nobody else other than our slave master that has the power to exalt you in our eyes. That's what they're saying. All right, now, now how dumb could a slave be? If a man come to you and you say, well, who made you the leader? And he say, well, a slave master didn't. That, that's the first thing should be in his favor instead of against him. So yeah, even if he say, well, I'm just making myself lead, he say, well, that's better than white folks. <laughs> I'd rather you make yourself a leader than for him to make you a leader. Do you think it is on your own? Yeah, well, fine. As long as you didn't get no white advice. <laughs> but we say, oh, no, you want to make yourself a prince over us. This was what the hypocrites said. This is what Korah accused Moses of out in the desert after he had freed the people. And the people were so weak-minded. They were so jealous and so envious so in love with their master that they didn't want to follow one of their own kind that they would listen to any type of little seed dropped against Moses and they went for it. They said, yeah, that's right. He is making himself a prince over us. How did they figure Moses had the power to make himself a prince over them? It was not Moses' power. It was God's power that got him out of Egypt. It was God's power that opened up the Red Sea for him. It was God's power that plagued Pharaoh even unto death to make him set him free. That was God's power that drew the water out of the rock. It was all God's power. So if God had the power to do all that, he had the power to make a prince, a leader, or whatever he wanted to make over them. But they couldn't see it. Because, why? Why couldn't they see it? Because they were following a man who wanted to be the prince himself. They were following Korah who wanted to be the leader himself. And any time you find somebody among a group of people who wants to be the leader and is not the leader, you got trouble on your hands. Trouble. Nothing but trouble. Until they either get straight or get straightened. Right. Praise the good Allah. <laughs> so the Honorable Elijah Muhammad is not trying to, to pride himself over the Negro leaders. He's been calling to them for years. Let's sit down and talk. He's told them for years. Let's put all our programs on the table. I'll put mine on the table, you put yours on the table, all of you put them on the table. Then let's look among them and see what we find. If you got a better plan, I'll bring all my followers and follow you. Now you can't beat that. That's not a man who's trying to be a leader, that's a man who's in love with his people. But if in being in love with his people, he's the best leader, there's nothing for him to do but be the leader. That's all there is to that. He's not trying to be big, he's not trying to be famous, he's not trying to be great. He's got the greatness, the bigness, and the fame that he needs to do the job. And he's doing the job. He's not trying to look good and shine in the eyesight of the world. He's trying to get to our people. Since he's the one qualified to do it, he's doing it. He's not going to step back now with a bunch of unqualified, envious nuts running around. He's not going to abdicate his responsibility and step back and say, well, since y'all feel that way, then I just won't do the job. No, he's going to do the job. 
though they be a verse, he's going to do the job. And they can say anything they want to and believe anything they want to. They can hang away from him as long as they think they want to. But they'll come. They'll come to him before he'll go to them. Oh, please do that. No, it wasn't Moses that destroyed Pharaoh's army. It was Moses' God that did it. <laughs> it's not the Honorable Elijah Muhammad that's washing these devils down off the hill. That's the Honorable Elijah Muhammad's God that's doing that. <laughs> can't, can't blame that on him. He hasn't made any rain yet. It's his God that makes it. It's his God that's freezing the crops, causing blizzards. The Honorable Elijah Muhammad hasn't brought a hurricane in yet. He hasn't sent a tornado out yet. It's his God that's sending the hurricanes and the tornadoes and destroying white folks in their property. <laughs> He's not trying to exalt himself. He's telling you about his God. So you can get out of the way of what his God is bringing on the enemy of his God. And it's not a strange God. The Honorable Elijah Muhammad is not teaching a strange God or a strange religion. As we pointed out, you and I have just lost our memory. We didn't lose it like, you know, we accidentally lost. That's not the kind of loss I mean. You know, when somebody robs you, that's a loss too. That's the kind of loss of memory we suffered. Somebody stole our memory from us. Oh, the Honorable Elijah Muhammad is teaching us of the God of salvation. A God that we had vague knowledge of, just didn't know, you know, how he really was. Been warped and all of that to make it appear something else make him appear to be nothing. And I don't doubt nothing can save something, but that's the way we were thinking. Now, the Honorable Elijah Muhammad is teaching us of the God of salvation. He's teaching us of the God of Noah. Same God that told Noah, I'm bringing some destruction. I'm going to give you some special plans. And everybody that you get with you can survive the destruction. Everybody don't get with you is not going to survive the destruction. It's the same God. Same God. Noah went around telling the people, God is going to destroy y'all. They said, you're teaching hate. You shouldn't be like that but it was all right. He kept on building his boat. They said, you're a nut. How you going to build a boat in the middle of the desert? Ain't no water around here, no how. You're making it out of balsam wood. It's too light. It would crack up at the first hard wave. You're putting pitch on it. You can't breathe in there. You can't get in and out of those little bitty doors. You ain't got but one little window in there. You don't know what you're doing. You never could build a boat. You ain't got no degree in boat building, you know, but he went on and built the boat. They said, you got it too fat for the length that it is. It can't float. Now, we know how we studied all this mathematics and we got all this physics down and aerodynamics and all that. You know well, that we know by the way you're constructing that, that according to the frame of reference which we have and according to our calculations and our analyses, we find that you don't have the proper mass distributed over the plane that will be developed if water does come so that you can stay afloat. The laws of immersion will cause your boat to sink. <laughs> So them and all their laws of immersion would drown while Noah was floating along in the ark. You understand? <laughs> they were such advisors. They were such good advisors on how the boat should be built, and they didn't even know you needed a boat till Noah started. It. Well, it's the same way today. The Honorable Elijah Muhammad woke our people up to the need for self-identity, the need to love black, the need to go for self. Now all of a sudden, here springs up a bunch of experts who never thought of nothing like that. Now they're saying, well, you know, now I go for Muhammad's plan myself. I believe we should go for self, but I think he ought to do it this way. Well, why didn't you do it? <laughs> if it just wasn't for this facet of his teaching, I think it's going to, now me and my group, we're going to go this way. We believe that you should have your own identity. We think you should be taught this and taught that. Okay, go ahead and teach and see how far you get. And a bunch of people running around now. They're going to teach Swahili and Bantu and Urdu and all that. All that's fine. The Honorable Elijah Muhammad says we should know the languages of the nation. That's good if you got time. You're going to be running around a bunch of polyglot idiots. Speak nine languages and can't make a toothstick. <laughs> you know? A welfare linguist. <laughs> a 
You notice Noah had a job going. He was working on something. Whole time he was teaching and preaching, he was building something. Because he knew what was coming and he knew what was going to be needed. He had the hammer to jumping and the nails to sinking and his heels to clicking. He didn't waste a minute because he knew that all his talk alone wasn't going to get it. There was something that had to be built. <laughs> That's the kind of God the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. That's the same God the Honorable Elijah Muhammad served. He didn't just go out and preach and after you preach everything's going to be all right. No, we got to work now. We got to build. We got to have something to make us survive what God's going to send on this enemy. <laughs> it's like Noah had to have something built to survive when God went on that enemy. Elijah Muhammad is teaching of the same God and representing the same God that Daniel represented. Daniel represented the same God that he represents. A God who raised up one of the slaves, told him, said, don't go by the slave master's name. Slave master wanted to call Daniel Belteshazzar. He said, no, Belteshazzar is not your name. Your name is Daniel. That was your name back home. That's your name that God gave you. Belteshazzar is the slave master's name. He got a son. He named Belshazzar. Y'all name sounds so much alike, so y'all could be brothers. That's what he wants you to think, that y'all are brothers. Right. So your children will grow up with his children and be dumb enough to think that... He owns everything, including him. <laughs> including your son. No, no, you keep your own name. You keep your own language. Learn his language. Master his language. Perfect his language. Learn how to use his language better than he can. So that you can get to the people of yours that don't know anything but his language. Yes, sir. But don't forget your own language. Yes, sir. Don't forget that. Don't eat what he tell you to eat. Because what he's going to make you eat, make you dumb, ugly. Oh, yeah. That's what the book said. The Bible said that they gave Daniel's people some meat that made them dumb and ugly. It said Daniel and his followers refused to eat it. They were better looking and smarter than any of their own people in the land. They looked different. You looked at them, they glowed like they were alive. Their eyes sparkled. They stood tall. They had vim and vigor and vitality. They had life in them. They didn't have that old dull faces. Yeah, that show is bad this morning. You know, they didn't have that. No, they had that spring in their walk. When they walked, you could see the power in them. <laughs> Those other people eating the king's meat, whatever the king pushed at them, they swallowed on down, they just vlog it. See them, they be frowning all the time. They see them, frowning. It looked just like what they was eating. That's right, they got uglier and uglier. Dumber and dumber. You say something to them, they stand there, and a few minutes later, hey, hey wait a minute, I got that. You know, brain dead. Well, because the king, that's why the king fed him that. But Daniel said, no, not me and my followers. Said that he told the jailer, just give us some pulse. And the Honorable Elijah Muhammad teaches us that if you trace that word, <laughs> dictionaries and encyclopedias and so forth, you'll find that pulse refers to a small white navy bean, which is the standard or a stock item in the diet of the followers of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad today. Right. That same little navy bean makes soup out of it and can live off of almost that and nothing else. <laughs> this is what Daniel said. No, just give us that. Give us those little white beans. You don't have to give us nothing. We don't want none of your meat. We don't want nothing to season it with. <laughs> none of that greasy kid stuff. <laughs> hey, we did all that. This is the same God that the Honorable Elijah Muhammad is representing today. We don't eat the king's meat. <laughs> don't eat it. Even if he does call it soul food. <laughs> We're not going to eat it. And we got more soul than anybody you know. <laughs> no, we're not going to eat it under any circumstance. Have many Muslims locked up in jail. The Honorable Elijah Muhammad himself was in jail and didn't eat it. And you know, they shove it at you every chance they get in the jail. He was there almost five years and he wouldn't eat it. We'll starve to death before we'll do that. Go against God's command. That's right. Die. You can put a sword to our necks if you want to. You just have to stick us. You're not going to eat that. 
No. The same guy that raised up Daniel raised up the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. Right. Same one. So, no, use your own name. Get rid of the slave master's name. That's what he taught him. Remember Daniel got in trouble because he didn't worship like the people wanted him to worship? Right. Slave master had one way for him to worship. He didn't want to worship that way. He had his own way of worship. Right. Every day, three times a day, he had an appointed prayer time. Right. And he would face in a certain direction, the, the direction from whence his people were brought. Right. And he would pray every day three times like that. Right. He didn't care nothing about what the ruler said. They didn't like that. His followers, they built this great big statue, wanted everybody to kneel down to it. His followers wouldn't all kneel down to that. No, that's not our God. We have our God. Daniel represents our God. We're not going to kneel down to no statue that looks like you. Especially since it looks like you. You know, they said, we sure would be fools. Now here you can come 9,000 miles, kidnapped us and brought us over here and made us your slave. Then you're going to give us something that looks just like you and tell us to kneel down. Man, you've got to be kidding. <laughs> no. Uh-uh. They had too much sense for it. Now the rest of Daniel's people went on for it. Anything to please his lady. But Daniel's father, Daniel and his father said, no. This ain't going to make us bow down to something that looks just like him. He kidnapped us, raped us, robbed us, enslaved us, lynched us, and all that. Now here he give us a picture and say, now you, this is your Lord. And the Lord looked just like the lyncher. <laughs> no. Uh-uh. No, wouldn't go for it. When you look at those cold blue eyes on that picture you got at home. Get a good picture of Governor Wallace, who y'all hate so bad. <laughs> Just look at his eyes. Look at the eyes on that calendar or whatever you got at home. Or that little thing with the bleeding heart or whatever you got. You got all kinds of stuff. We used to have one down here somewhere. Oh, yeah, we got one. Yeah. Now, a couple of weeks ago, they had an eruption on the Sunset Strip. They had a bunch of young beatniks out there that were causing a disturbance. And I guarantee you, you saw this face at least a thousand times. That's right. I defy you. you can, if you took this, I guarantee you, if you'd have walked in that crowd or walked into jail after they arrested them, you could have found somebody that you would have swore posed for this picture. That's right. Just look at it. Now, who is it? Ain't no name on it. Now, to tell you how, how <laughs> look how we've been messed up. Now, all you see here is a white man with a beard and long hair. Now, when I held this up, you know some of y'all got rocks in your jaws. You know why? First thing y'all thought, that's Jesus. What makes this Jesus? <laughs> See what the Honorable Elijah Muhammad has to overcome? You know he really has a fight on his hands. I mean, this stuff is in us so deep. I, 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 everybody, Muslim and non-Muslim alike, when I held up that picture, the first thing you thought of was Jesus. Right now. That's right. Here we are. We the freest black people you can find, and we ain't got free yet. That's right. Now, this man has his hooks deep in us. And this is one of the mistakes that we can make even after we begin to follow the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. We're not very, very careful. This is, one of the, this is the biggest mistake we can make. We get to the point where we think that the white man no longer influences our brain. We let our guard down and it's all over. No, we, we keep constantly aware if we're intelligent. Keep constantly aware. So yeah, he had us 400 years and the messenger had some of us four months, four years and something like that. No. Uh -uh. Don't you ever think that 400 years has been washed away. Right. No, you keep your guard up at all times. Right. <laughs> all praises due to Allah. The Honorable Elijah Muhammad is representing the God of Joshua. The Joshua who won the greatest, one of the greatest battles in the Bible by just uniting his people. All they had to do was be in unity behind him. And he won. Same thing the Honorable Elijah Muhammad is telling us today. We got to unite together. And we got to unite behind him. They couldn't have united behind anybody else and won that battle. Right. Now, they could have walked around there and tooted their horns. They could have been blowing anything that they wanted to blow. And they could have been shouting and all of that, doing all the marching they wanted. Because, you know, some of them had been marching before. They couldn't do it. But now, when Joshua said march, the way God told them to have a march, the march meant something. They had, what, 100,000 people marching to Washington. They ain't got nothing. What happened? Nothing. 
And they've been marching in the streets of every city ever since. What's happened? Nothing. Nothing at all. But now, if God calls a march, <laughs> I guarantee you something will happen. If God tells the Honorable Elijah Muhammad to have us to march, we won't need 100,000. <laughs> and I guarantee you, it'll be something happen. Do you understand? He's serving the same God that Joshua served. So it's not impossible that God might tell us to march. Most soldiers have parades sometimes. <laughs> But whatever we have to do, we're going to have to do it in unity behind the leadership of the Honorable Elijah Muhammad. No other way to do it. This is what the story of Joshua is pointing out plainly. They didn't sing any new songs. God didn't tell him, now Joshua, you have to teach him some new songs. You have to teach him some new chants. You have to teach him to say something different. You have to teach him some new notes to play on their horns. You didn't have to teach him none of that. So apparently they already knew the changes. They just had to get behind Joshua. And when he got behind Joshua, it was a different thing altogether. The walls come tumbling down. Is that the way they say it in the song? Said Joshua fit the battle of Jericho. And the walls came and tumbling down. How did he fight? According to the thing, when the walls came tumbling down, he hadn't lifted a sword. He hadn't even unsheathed a weapon. They were walking around in unity, marching and shouting. But he was fighting. He was fighting like God, according to God's battle plan. And the walls come tumbling down. Same walls. They've been around there with pickaxes and dynamite and everything else and couldn't get those walls down. But all Joshua did was, and again, to anybody looking on who was a disbeliever, Joshua would have looked foolish. It's the first thing they would have said. Man, we can try everything on those walls and they won't work. Now, you think just by your people walking around there shouting it's going to happen? <laughs> yes, God said shout. Praises do that a lot. And he's serving the same God that gave Moses the power to lead his people to freedom. Same guy. Teaching the same thing. Separation. And everybody else was teaching, try to get tight with the slave master. That's what they were doing. Try to get tight with the slave master. Oh, let's get closer to him. Maybe he'll treat us better. Moses said, no, he ain't going to treat you no better. He'll treat you a little better when it's to his advantage, but you just, first time you get out of line, you remember that he's still the master and you're still the slave. You get out of your place and he'll put you back in it real fast. Moses said, no, you want freedom. Moses was a liberator. So you want liberty, you want freedom, you want to go for yourself. You can't be free in Pharaoh's house working for Pharaoh. You can't do it. You got to get out to do it. You got to have your own house, creating your own job, producing your own need. Then you're free. And only then are you free. Now that's intelligent. If you and I hadn't lost our memory, we would know right away that's what we've been needing. But because we lost our memory, we can't see that. Well now that, how are we going to make it without the white man? Same way we made it all of those millions and trillions and billions of years before the white man. The way we were making it when Marco Polo and them came over there, they didn't even know how to put, they didn't know what salt and pepper was. And we were over there using turmeric and allspice and everything else and cooking good, eating good, wearing silks. They didn't even know how to weave cotton. They couldn't even make cotton over there running. All they do is kill an animal, skin him, and, and throw his skin over their body to try to keep warm. And we were over there making the finest of silk, raising silkworms, growing mulberry trees. Oh, we were into it. <laughs> growing watermelon out in the desert. Out in the middle of the desert. Can you imagine that? Look, look, look where watermelon grows. <laughs> out in the sand. Ain't no water from nowhere around. Plant the seed around. Here come this thing just full of water and sugar. <laughs> White man still don't understand it. All he do is just use it. He don't know how we did that. But, you know, tell me, how can we get along without him? We got along fine. The question is, how can we get along with him? We can. That's what 400 years has proven. The Honorable Elijah Muhammad is not only not teaching us a new God, he's not teaching us a new religion. This is that old-time religion. Now, you think about that old-time religion? It's good enough for me? This is it. The religion of Islam, as the Honorable Elijah Muhammad is teaching it to us today. You know how you used to say, it was good for my mother? It was good for my father, 
It's good enough for me? Well, you couldn't have been talking about Christianity. It ain't never been no good for mama, daddy, grandma, grandpa, and nobody else. Now, that, that may sound cold, but that's fact. You see what shape they were in, don't you? You see what shape they left us in, don't you? No, it had to be going back to mother and father who were the ancestors of these who were in Christianity. That old-time religion that our forefathers had, it was good enough for them. That's what our people be thinking about and don't even know it. That old-time religion, not this thing that we got when we came on the slave block, but that old-time religion. It was good for my father because he was the king. It was good for my mother because she was the queen. It was good for them. <laughs> it's good enough for me. We don't need this that has made us slaves. That ain't good enough for me, not in 1967. Not good enough for me. It was no good for my mother. It was no good for my father. Messed up their brains, ruined their health, and everything else. No, we don't need that. But we want that old-time religion. That old time, the religion that has been with God ever since there's been a God. That wasn't Christianity. By their own admission, they themselves say Christianity wasn't on the scene before Jesus died. Isn't that what they say? They teach you that Christianity means Christ-like, following Christ? Well, then what was the religion of God before Jesus ever came on the set? What was Moses' religion? He wasn't a Christian. And, and all the people who believe in Moses call themselves something else, Jews and all that. They're not Christians. What was Abraham's religion? He was a friend of God and he wasn't a Christian. He never called on Jesus and was successful. I mean, just, we want you to examine these. We were talking about that old-time religion, Abraham's religion, Moses' religion, Noah's religion. Noah never called on Jesus. He was saved. He was here before Jesus. Had the key to life in his hand. Never knew nothing about Jesus. He wasn't a Christian. We want that old-time religion. 